Um, it's described in my thesis, it takes about a page. Um, but the intuition is pretty simple. And that, that's sufficient for us. Essentially, the common bar of complexity of something is the length of its shortest description. And the intuition is quite simple. So let's say you have a sequence of a, a trillion zeros, right? A very short description of that is a trillion zeros, right? And you can describe it in terms of a computer program for i equals 1 to a trillion, print zero. And so it has a very short program. And that program is, in effect, a description. It's a computable description. And so what we, if you want to describe something as much, much more complex, say, or even a little bit more complex, something like pi, the program is quite a bit bigger to generate the infinite sequence of digits of pi. And then there are, there are much, much more complicated things where there are only very large programs to describe them. So the intuition is that simple things are things that you can describe very compactly. They have short descriptions. Complex things only have long descriptions. They don't have short descriptions. That's your intuition. Okay? Between complexity is all to do with the description length. How, how short is the description of the thing? And so here, we say that the common of complexity of some, that's going to be a probability distribution of the sequences, is the length of the shortest program. And so to go back to our example here, um, we had the sequence before, um, to the minus 1, this is what you all suspected using, uh, using Occam's razor. It has a very short program, so it has low complexity. This here is going to have a longer program, it has higher complexity. That's the intuition. So if you believe in Occam's razor, this high complexity, low probability. Oh, sorry, low complexity, high probability, high complexity, low probability. Okay? Right. So... This is, this is the universal uh, prior probability of, of an hypothesis. What we do is the um, distribution is, we have a, the length of a program and it's computed by a universal Turing machine which takes bits as input. And so with each bit the probability halves, right? For the, the length of the program. This is why we have 2 to the power of negative. So that's just a half. And then it just, it just multiplies up. So the intuition is that the more complex the explanation about the world is, uh, the lower the probability and vice versa. Okay, so that's your intuition. And that, that is Occam's razor defined for you. And we take the space of all the hypotheses here to be essentially all distributions over sequences, which is an enormous space. We actually even do it more general than that. But, yeah, I won't get into that. So, this prior respects Epicurus rule because, well, firstly, this is an enormous space here. It's all the different, all the different distributions. Yes? But you wouldn't expect, would you expect the sum of the probability to be one? Um, so, yeah, there is some, you have to, you have to normalize a bit, and it depends how you define some things. If you use um, so-called prefix, prefix-free universal Turing machines, then the prefix-free property on the lengths, on the program lengths, means that you can bound this using craft inequality and then and then you can normalize properly or you can do other things. So yeah. Okay? So yes, it, it is delta. Okay. Um, so yeah it respects the Epicurus rule because any anything that's going to get a um, anything has with a with a finite that's that has a computable distribution is going to be finite here so it has some positive probability. So that's satisfied. And it formalizes Occam's razor. We've got the complexity is proportional, inversely proportional to the probability. Okay? So we've formalized, uh, we've come up with a prior that captures Epicurus rule uh, and Occam's razor. Now, there's a little bit of technicality here. If you want to actually predict over sequences, we need to actually consider all the different hypotheses and then the probability of the sequence you've observed so far, and then, then they sort of mix them all up. Okay? So if you use the probability theory, this is, this is an expected thing to do, right? You, you consider all the different ex possible explanations for what you've seen. You have to weight according to how probable they think what you've seen is and how probable you think that explanation is. If you don't follow that, don't worry about it. That's what you So here's our C symbol. It's Marcus's uh, favorite Greek letter. And this is going to, this plays an enormous role. This distribution has some incredible properties, some very, very special properties. Now, 
what, what we're going to do is we're going to try to predict sequences using this C distribution, okay? And this is called Solomonoff induction. And so what happens is we have some sequence omega, we've seen all these digits coming along, and it's coming from some distribution that we don't know. That's the whole point. We don't know what's generating the thing. We're trying to infer what that is. We're trying to learn something about the world. And so the notation here is that we have omega, that's 1 to n, so that's the digit, the first digit up to the nth digit. That's what we've observed, time n. And we're trying to predict what the next, the next bit is in our sequence. Okay? And so the way to do that is just basic probability theory. We just take the conditional probability. Given, given what we observed, probability of the next bit is, say, at 0. We just, say that we just take the, the standard probability, probability, conditional probability stuff, right? So it's the probability of what we observed with 0, and the divided, normalized by the probability of what we observed. Simple as that. How well does this work? Turns out it works ridiculously well. Just insanely great. <laughs> it is really insanely great. Um, for any, really, any unknown computable distribution, and you, this can be anything. This can be um, quantum mechanics is, is actually a computable theory, right? It's Turing computable, the, the update equations and all these things. It includes that. Relative Newton's laws of physics, you can put this in, in, in this format. Any computable distribution over anything you observe. So this is a massive space. This is absolutely gigantic, right? And for any of these, any of these possible hypotheses about the world, and you don't even know what they are to start with, the expected total error, and I won't define exactly what that means, but it's basically the, the, the deviation between the expected deviation between if you actually knew the correct answer versus if you're using this as a predictor. And you can see it in the thesis, of course. Over the infinite length, so that's over all the predictions for the rest of infinity, it's bounded by a constant. There's a constant amount of error you're going to make, no matter what it is that's generating the distribution. And you look at this constant, that is the length of the shortest description of the actual generating mechanism. This thing is learning almost as fast as if you just told it the answer to start with. It's ridiculous. Now, some, if, you, if you read about this, one of the things that people complain about is the Commodore of complexity depends a bit on the choice of reference machine. It depends on the language you're using. But it's bounded by a constant there. And so even if you change the language around, you're just putting a constant number of bits in here, maybe a thousand bits or something to go between different Turing machines. And so if you actually plug this into, say, a video feed, and it takes a thousand bits more to converge, I mean, come on. This converges for anything. You just plug CNN in here and it'll start modeling the entire world that CNN sees or whatever, right? But it's only a theoretical calculation. <laughs> the catch. <laughs> <laughs> the catch. It only works in theory because C is not computable. If it was computable, we'd probably be trying to predict the stock market and becoming fabulously wealthy. Yes? Is there a problem with um, fractal type functions where the shortest program may actually be very short and yet the complexity of the output is actually very high? Well... Does it misestimate the... the okay, so when you, when you say that, what you're saying is that essentially the complexity of something is not just a function of its length, but it's a function of its computation time. And that is, that's a perfectly valid way to view complexity. And it's not the way Commodore complexity views it. Commodore complexity says, um, I mean, for example, the laws of quantum mechanics, right? You can write them down, in some sense they're quite simple, right? And so in Occam's razor sense, maybe that's a good explanation. On the other hand, actually computing what's going on in a complicated system using them is incredibly intractable, using a classical computer anyway, right? So, that's fair enough. You, you, and I, I, I agree with you, you may want to use different notions of simplicity than just quantum complexity. And that's, I think that's, you can quite reasonably argue that. Okay? It's like Mandelbrot said it's different to a sine wave. That working out what is the function that generated it, right, are both very different, right. different well, things. And one would take a lot more computational time. Than yes. Yeah. Or could have random output. Yeah. I mean, which is in theory very short form of complexity, yeah. but. Yeah. Figuring out the program is uh, computationally very difficult. Sure. Yep. 
So that's yeah, it's a perfectly reasonable perspective to take. That's, that's an alternative perspective. I think the trick here is that you're using something that's not computable, so it does all the computation.